for inviting me, and it is so great to see such a big crowd here tonight. It's, it's really exciting that so many people have come out to learn more about what can be done to maximize brain health and independence in older age. Um, I am going to be talking about technology, but Tom also wanted me to talk about uh, kind of prevention work too. So you're going to see um, kind of different threads of my research, and I'm going to be going through a, a lot of material in this small amount of time, but I really do want to introduce you to all of this because uh, I think it's really important work, and I'm really excited to be able to share it, especially with so many seniors. Okay, you're probably all aware that the world's population is aging. Uh, in America alone, by 2030, one in five Americans is expected to be over the age of 65. Now, this is bringing with it a health care capacity crisis. So we're used to thinking about the world's population as a triangle where there's lots of younger individuals and not so many seniors. But we're starting to see this change to more of a, a square where we're seeing just as many seniors at the top as younger people. And so one of the questions we have is how are we really going to care for this aging population, especially if we don't have as many professionals and caregivers available. And it's going to be very, very important that we figure out ways to do this in a way that's going to keep the quality of life of our senior population. So how can we start addressing this health care challenge? I'm going to be talking about several different things that we have been working on in our lab. Um, the first has to do with prevention. Uh, what can we do to prevent or um, decrease our chances of maybe developing something like Alzheimer's? Um, the other two sections have to do with compensation. But compensation and prevention go hand in hand. So if I'm having difficulties walking and I'm using a walker, I'm compensating, but I'm also preventing because if I didn't use that walker, I might fall and break my hip, and then that would lead to a whole host of other things, too. So I'm going to be talking about aging assistive technologies as well as some of our work with intelligent or smart technologies. And you can see what some of the advantages are there. So in terms of prevention, by the year 2050, if we don't find something to help delay the onset of Alzheimer's, 13.5 million people are expected to have Alzheimer's disease. Now data for the Alzheimer's Association suggests that if we could de develop a treatment that would delay Alzheimer's by just five years, 5.7 million less people would have Alzheimer's in 2050. And we would save families about $87 billion, not to mention the cost of care uh, savings to society. When we, um, uh, now as we've done more research, we've come to understand that changes associated with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias can occur in the brain as many as 20 years before we start to actually see the symptoms of those cognitive changes. And so now we talk about the normal aging, let's see if I can get this. I'm not fine, okay. Okay, well, you can see that. The, the normal, maybe, maybe I can do them now. Yeah. Okay, this will work. So the normal aging process, um, and before we used to have normal aging and dementia. And when we use the term dementia, it's kind of an umbrella term um, of individuals who are unable to function independently. So they had enough change in their cognitive abilities and their functional abilities that they really can't live independently. We have this um, middle stage now, which we call mild cognitive impairment. These are individuals who um, are thought to be on the progression towards a dementia process. They're starting to show changes in their cognition that are more than what we would see in the normal aging process. And they may be having some difficulties with more complex everyday tasks, such as managing finances or cooking complex um, uh, recipes, but they're able to function independently um, pretty well. Uh, the literature is also suggesting now that we might even have a pre-MCI stage, or one that's called subjective cognitive decline, where people are reporting changes in their cognition, but our tests aren't really sensitive enough to capture them. So we do have more of a continuum of change in cognition and in functional abilities. The question is, 
is there something that we can do to enhance our cognitive or our functional resilience or reserve? What can we do to prevent, if we're on that trajectory of change towards a dementia, is there something that we can do to help reduce that risk? We now know that there are a number of things out there in the, that we can do that show correlations or have shown relationships with increased Alzheimer's risk and some things that have been associated with decreased risk. Now, some of the increased risk factors are things that you can't change. So you're not going to be able to change your age or your genotype or your female sex, but there are other things up there that you do have some control over if you engage in more um, better health related practices. So decreasing things like uh, obesity or diabetes, uh, reducing your depression and stress, reducing hypertension, uh, avoiding head injuries, stop smoking, uh, things that we know are really important in terms of decreasing risk for Alzheimer's are things like exercise, diet and nutrition, sleep, uh, higher education, cognitive engagement, and social engagement. In fact, I'm going to have to put my glasses on probably to read this, but um, there is some data that suggests that a 10 to 25 percent improvement in a combination of seven modifiable risk factors, physical inactivity, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, smoking, and depression, and education cognitive inactivity could potentially prevent up to 3 million cases of AD worldwide. And sometimes I don't think that there's enough information out there about the importance of really these health uh, prevention activities. So in terms of some of the work that we've been doing, um, most prior prevention research has focused on single risk factors for intervention. So um, for example, exercise programs to decrease obesity. There are now several large prevention programs going on around the world that are targeting multiple risk factors with the idea that these um, helping multiple aspects like diet and exercise could have more of a synergistic effect in terms of prevention. Now a lot of these studies follow very highly prescriptive goals and they may cost a lot of money to implement. Um, the goals may not be intrinsically motivated, so the person may be come in and told this is the exercise regime that, that you're going to follow. And that the way that they're taught, it may be something that's not going to transfer very easily to a person's everyday life. And if it doesn't transfer easy and you can't sustain it after the exercise program has been taught to you, then it's not going to allow for you to sustain the, the, that daily preventative health behavior. So one of the questions that we've been working on is how can we help people adapt these evidence-based behaviors into their everyday lives in a way that's really going to be sustainable, that's going to work for them. We know that health behavior change is difficult. And there are some things or strategies that we know can be helpful in promoting success. So setting specific and realistic goals, things that you can actually reach. So if you're not walking at all, you don't want to decide you're going to start walking five days a week to start with, or 40 minutes five days a week. You want to start small. You want to take baby steps and, and work towards that overall goal. You want to also figure out a way to make it part of your routine, because if it becomes part of your routine, then you can continue to do it. You also want to utilize social support. Other people can be very, very helpful motivators and eliminate any sort of barriers out there to your success. So the intervention that we have been working on, we call it brain fit or be fit. And the idea is the, what we want to do is help people engage in these preventative health behaviors in a way that's going to work for them and be integrated into their everyday life. And it's, more, it's, it's somewhat of a synergistic um, intervention. We draw upon both self-determination theory, where we try to get people to um, be more intrinsically motivated about the goals because they actually set the goals that are specific and workable for them. And we also um, incorporate psychoeducation and group support and group problem solving. So I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about the intervention. Um, each time the group meets, it's a very kind of regimented schedule that they follow. So there's time for initial socialization, so the group really gets to know each other and supports each other. Um, the go-around section is where we check in each week on the goals that each person had individually set, see how well they're working, and see if there's any sort of adjustments or changes that might need to be met. 
Each week, there's education about a different preventative brain health behavior. And then each individual chooses their own goal that they want to set for that week that's related to a change in that health behavior. They're going to fill out, and I guess I'll show you that next, a um, goal setting plan sheet where they say, you know, why is this goal important to me? Here's my goal. This is why it's important. And this is how I'm going to do it. This is when I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to integrate it into my, into my everyday life. This is my plan. And then we pick a number of people each session to go through their plan, and the group problem solves as a whole. So you get to learn about what other people are planning to do in terms of incorporating new things into their everyday life, and you, need, you get to help them problem solve any potential pitfalls that you might see. And then we have a final socializing session. These are the different topic areas that we discuss. So each week is a different topic. We look at things like exercise and nutrition and stress management and sleep that are all important for kind of physiological um, health. Uh, we also look at things like social and cognitive engagement. And social engagement might not be something that you guys think of as being important to uh, brain health. And in fact, there's a, a lot of newer studies that are coming out that are suggesting that being involved uh, socially and staying engaged is very important to good brain health. Um, we also talk about assistive technologies and also um, compensatory strategies. So why did we pick these topics? Well, we did a lot of research, and research has repeatedly highlighted the importance of these topics in terms of promoting healthy brain aging. Um, for example, there's been research that has shown things like exercise, uh, cognitive engagement, social engagement may actually result in structural changes in the brain. I think there was an article that came out not too long ago that actually said engaging in exercise, like pretty heavy physical exercise, could actually take 10 years off of your brain aging. So there, there, there's more, more data coming out. That, that might be a, a little grandiose, but, but there is data coming out um, that, that is suggesting that these things are, are very, very important. Um, we're seeing improvements in specific areas of cognitive functioning, like memory related to changes in the hippocampus, um, better overall cognition, including a slowing in the rate of cognitive decline, and then reduced uh, risk of dementia. So um, we're still in the early stages of this work. The first thing that we did was complete a feasibility study to see whether or not integrating these approaches would work and whether older adults would find uh, this approach of interest. <laughs> so we ran two separate groups, and these were 10-week um, groups. They met one time per week for two hours. And one of the things that was particularly uh, notable for us is that we recruited these participants so quickly. So within like three days, we, we had our two groups um, that were made. People were really interested in learning about these healthy brain aging behaviors. So we thought that was a pretty good start. Um, once the intervention started, we retained 100%. And if people missed the session, it was for things like um, they uh, were on vacation or illness. Um, in our focus groups, People spontaneously commented about each component of the intervention. So each component seemed to be adding something, like, I like the go-around because it helped keep me motivated. I knew I was going to answer to the other people in the group. Um, I, I like the problem solving and working it out with a group because I learned interesting ideas from other people. Um, and then the focus groups also helped us in terms of making some decisions about where we were going to go with the intervention. Um, we're in towards the end of a small pilot intervention. We're actually doing our um, one-year follow-ups as uh, I'm here talking, actually, although they probably tested for the day. Um, we had 50 participants involved, and we ran three groups, so the BFIT intervention and education only, which only got the education about the brain health, so we call that an active control condition, controlling for the social support that was involved um, and the education that they were getting, and then a no treatment. Our primary outcome variable was whether people were engaging in more of these healthy brain aging behaviors. And then secondary outcomes are things like actually measuring physical and cognitive capacity. We did some blood draws to look at physiological and metabolic health, and then some measures of well-being. So this is really the only data slide um, from the study that I'm going to present. Um, but it does show you, uh, and the, our questionnaire is called the Healthy Brain Aging Questionnaire. I was finding out. Okay, so um, 
both the BFIT and the education only group showed significant e increases from pre to um, post testing, so pre intervention to post intervention, and there were no changes in the no treatment group, and both of these groups actually did better than the no treatment group. Um, the, the measure itself can be broken down into different aspects of health, and our older adults were engaging in health safety behaviors. These were things like not smoking, um, wearing a seatbelt, and so that was very high to begin with. But we were able to increase some of the, the exercise, the diet, the cognitive and, and social um, aspects of the behaviors that they were engaging in. And we did find that for the physiological health, we did find some trends to decreases um, in some of the bad, bad things related to things like blood glucose levels being decreased and glycohemoglobin. So we're excited to find out whether or not we're able, especially in the BFIT group, um, to have these individuals maintaining those healthy brain aging behaviors over the year of the intervention. We are excited that even education was increasing um, the types of behaviors, but the real question is going to be the sustainability. So in, in summary, prevention is right now a very important cornerstone in our fight against Alzheimer's disease. We know that behavior change is difficult, and one of the things that we really need to be working towards is finding efficacious methods for which we can help older individuals, and, and not even actually the, this um, brain fit intervention, I actually want to start ta targeting middle-aged adults because we have to get people started very early and have them continue these health-related behaviors. I mean, we can even take that down, right, to, to our kids, our college-age students. You know, we, we, it's really important that we start adapting um, these uh, behaviors early. Okay, so that's part one on prevention. Now I want to go in to talk a little bit about our work in the area of aging services technology. So I said both prevention and compensation are important. So aging services technology is a definition for this. is health technologies that meet the health care needs of seniors, individuals with disabilities, and the caregivers of such seniors and individuals. Oops. Um, there are wide ranges of assistive technologies out there, and they can range from very low-tech things like um, uh, seven-day pill holders, which I'm guessing many people use, to very high-tech things like um, apps that you can put on your phone that will remind you um, to take your medication. And in the third section, I'm going to talk about even higher things like our intelligent technology that understands when you typically take medications. Um, we know that aging services technologies can increase functional independence, they can enhance life satisfaction, they can promote safety, reduce caregiver burden because they decrease the amount of personal assistance that's required, and they can lower health care costs. But one of the things that is very obvious is that these aging services technologies are being underutilized. There was a big report to Congress that concluded that one of the, the main reasons is because there's a lack of awareness out there um, about these uh, technologies and also a dearth of available resources for people to go to. Other things like social stigma, um, cost, what sort of access there is, does insurance cover them. Uh, for some of the more high-tech technologies, there may be questions about privacy issues. Um, also, lack of product support or, or some other things that, that may um, cause issues for adoption. There's a number of models out there, too, that talk about how people may become, ex or like what things are important in terms of people accepting technology. And these range from things like the match between the individual and the environment to what's the perceived usefulness, how easy it is, is it going to be to use the technology, what are people's attitudes, um, what's my self-efficacy about using the technology. And so these are some things that we kept in mind as we were developing this program and actually um, analyzing the data. So the aim of this particular study, and this was actually funded by a grant from the Attorney General's office in our state, was to increase awareness and attitudes and knowledge about technologies for users, caregivers, and professionals. And the reason that I had become interested in this is because 
I have been doing some work with individuals with mild cognitive impairment and their care partners surrounding um, training in, in compensatory strategies and memory notebooks. And one of the women did all of this research and developed or, or learned how to use a lot of helpful technologies with her husband to help keep him independent. And she had to spend so much time doing this. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could put that all together in one area? Little did I know how much work we were in for. Um, but I'm really hoping that some of you will, will go to our site, Tech for Aging, and, and use um, uh, this information. So one of the things that we were interested in doing, first of all, was developing this video series that was going to help with a number of different areas. So fall prevention, um, daily living aids, we have uh, these different videos, mobility, memory aids, hearing, vision, medication management, and communication. In developing these, we worked with both the experts in Washington and Idaho. And one of the things in the research that we were interested in doing is, first of all, seeing if we could increase people's um, engagement in using these aging assistive technologies, but also could we evaluate what some of those mechanisms of change might be. Our medium of delivery are these videos, and we use participatory design, working with the older adults to get the videos um, in such a way that, that they would be useful. <coughs> so I'm not going to have time to play a whole video, but I'm just going to play a little bit of the memory aids video. It kind of comes in part way into it, but you'll, you'll get a feel for what we've done. We had a communication professor. I don't know why it's not coming up. I may have to press this. Oh, this will be really sad. Uh, Luke can fix it. Oh, Luke? <laughs> <laughs> I, I could also escape out and go right to the original. Okay. Oh, I'm cleaning up. Okay. okay, wait, stay here just in case. <laughs> so that means. In this video, we discuss devices that oh, help okay. support yes. everyday memory, including locators, okay. reminders, recording devices, and safety aids. <laughs> locators. Picture-based phones allow for easy dialing without having to remember or look up phone numbers. Simply push a picture of friends, stores, or emergency numbers. For misplaced items, object finders are an easy solution. Simply attach a finder to important objects that are easily lost, such as keys, a wallet, or an eyeglass case. Use the main locator to find objects when needed. Some object finders can locate many different items. Smartphone apps are also available. Some use GPS technology to locate the item and provide the approximate address of the object. Reminders. To help with reminders, Customized voice messages can be played at set times. It's time to lock the door before bed. Remote speakers are available so the reminders can be heard throughout the house. Portable pocket-sized personal reminders are also available. Electronic calendars can play customized messages Today, Tuesday, September 24th. One message about medication. You have an appointment with Dr. Thompson at 1 p.m. Appointments, family events, or other daily needs. Messages can be recorded for daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly reminders. Web-based reminder systems. It's time to pick up the trash for Monday morning pickup. Can provide verbal reminders by phone. These services can give an unlimited amount of reminders, including wake-up calls, reminders of important events, and even when to take medication. Recurring calls and snooze features are also available with these systems. A daily planner paired with a watch alarm 
can be an effective and low-tech memory aid. <coughs> Maintain doctor's appointments, birthdays, and grocery list all in one location. Make using a daily planner part of your everyday routine. So one of the things that I've found is very helpful for me is I, I have like a little journal or what we call a memory notebook. And I use that to uh, record appointments, things I need to do, uh, phone calls maybe I, that I've received uh, to remind me about, uh, you know, so I don't forget them. And uh, I appreciate, you know, every little bit of help to keep uh, my memory as sharp as I would like it to be. And uh, so I'm very pleased that these things are available to me. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a good feel for what we've done in this video series. Um, we had the assistance of um, one of the communication, thank you, um, one of the communication faculty who, who did the filming and we had actors from the community who graciously gave their time to um, assist us with this. Uh, on the web page, you'll also find our AST information brochure, which just has information about the different categories of things, and so you can see we're, we're not promoting any one um, sort of technology, and also information about price, too. So this gives you an idea of what the participants in our studies um, viewed. So uh, we had 231 older adult users, we had um, 58 caregivers and 65 professionals who went through this particular study. Um, most of it was done in group meetings, but we also had this information online. So we had some participants from as far away as, as Florida who participated in this. Um, Pre-test, we gave them a questionnaire that asked about their knowledge about ASTs, their attitude, looked at their stigma, looked at their self-efficacy. We also did an objective measure where we gave them, you can see down in the, the corner here, now I'm pressing the red button and, okay. I, I can't see that far or something. I don't know, was the red button up there? You were aiming too low. Oh, I was aiming too low, okay. Well, I, I think I'll just stick here. So, oh, Okay. Um, so here is an example from our tool identification task where they'd be shown a tool and they'd be asked to um, identify what it was. Um, we also asked about their engagement or in terms of uh, professionals about their recommendation use of ASTs. Then we gave them a broad overview about ASTs and then they watched three of the videos and the videos were counterbalanced. So it was the medication management, daily living aids and memory. And then at post-test, we repeated the same measures, got some information about demographics and program satisfaction. And for the older adult users, we also had a four-week follow-up. Um, the results we were very pleased with in terms of um, showing that both objectively and in terms of self-report, users, caregivers, and professionals were reporting a significant increase in their knowledge. In terms of attitude, um, we saw an increase for the users. The caregivers and the professionals really came into the study with pretty high attitudes about ASTs to start with. In terms of stigma, you can see that for the users and caregivers, we were able to reduce stigma. For all groups, we increased self-efficacy about assistive technology use. And then for all groups, they reported um, an increase in intention to use or to recommend. Um, assistive technologies. And what was particularly exciting was that at the four-week follow-up that these um, findings were, were still there for our older adult users. So, so we had um, some sustainability of the findings. We also wanted to look at kind of what were those mechanisms that might be related to change. And in regression analysis with the older adult users, what really came out was that reducing perceived stigma about the technologies really increase people's intention to change and use more of those assistive technologies. And for the healthcare professionals, in terms of recommending technologies, um, it was feeling more knowledgeable and increasing their self-efficacy that had um, the biggest effect. So we were, um, you know, we're happy to see that just, you know, exposing people to these aging services technologies um, is improving at least their knowledge about the technologies and their perceptions as well as increasing self-efficacy. 
Um, we think that interventions that perhaps target perceived stigma may be important for increasing aging services technology use among users. And then for professionals, because it's really important if your professionals don't know about these technologies, they're not going to recommend them to you, right? Or if they don't feel comfortable with them, they're not going to recommend them to you. So we think it's really important that we find ways to increase knowledge and self-efficacy among our healthcare professionals about these technologies. And again, um, the website for this is Tech for Aging. Um, so I think if you just put in like Tech for Aging, you, you'll probably be able to pull that up. Okay, so now I'm going to shift gears and really talk about our intelligent technology. So this is a very exciting um, area of research, only made possible by the collaboration um, be between psychology and computer science and engineers and nursing and many other um, uh, people that we are working with. But smart environments are environments that can passively and continuously collect information about a person and then use that information to help support an individual with their everyday activities. And one of the things that I'm especially interested in is using it to assist with more proactive and preventative health care, as well as with real-time interventions. So here are some possible clinical applications. Um, we may be able to use this information that we gather from people living in these smart homes, from this continuous data, to assist with diagnosis, to capture acute health care changes. A person hasn't gotten out of bed and taken, um, eaten their breakfast and it's 11 o'clock and they went to bed at their normal time. Maybe this is some, you know, maybe we need to check in on that person. Um, or maybe the person has started walking around their home differently. They are um, taking longer to do their activities. And so maybe there's something going on that if we could intervene earlier, we may be able to prevent something more significant happen. And we may be able to capture those changes before even the person or maybe a significant other notices. And then how can we provide that health assistance? How can we um, interact uh, in such a way that we can assist people with their daily activities, we can help promote those healthy lifestyle behaviors, and even recovery. So this um, is kind of our view, like if this is the traditional what, what happens with aging, we want to hold the functional abilities out for a long period of time and keep people functioning independently. And our smart home is designed to use sensors, and I'll show you those in just a minute, to sense the activities, to then identify what's happening through activity recognition, to assess the, the functional abilities and whether some sort of intervention needs to happen, and then to act. And so we've been working on all aspects um, of this. So we get a lot of our data from these sensors. Um, these are sensors that you could get at the hardware store. They're infrared motion sensors. And so when a person walks under them, they'll click on, and when they leave the area, they'll click off. And that's how we track where a person is in the environment. We also have sensors that um, can say whether a door or cabinet has been opened and closed. And we have sensors that we can put on things like um, the stove. And we do that in our smart home test bed, but not, not so much when we put these in people's homes. Uh, but we can put sensors in refrigerators to know when the refrigerator is opened and closed. Um, we can have ambient sensors to know like what the temperature is in the room. Um, we have a smart home test bed on campus where we bring uh, younger adults, older adults, individuals with more cognitive impairment and dementia in, and we have them do different activities of daily living. Uh, so we may um, ask them to water some plants or to cook some oatmeal. And while they are doing those activities, we are behaviorally coding what is happening and tagging the sensor data. So you can see um, that as the different sensors are going on and off, it's tagging exactly what's happening at that time. The person is washing the countertops, they're getting the sponge. And we behaviorally code how well individuals are doing these different tasks. Now, um, this video, if it comes on, will show you what happens to the data. Okay, so as a person comes in and they're doing these different tasks, you're going to see these different sensors are going on and off. 
And you can kind of track the motion, although it's not with, with the red dots um, below in the video, as she's moving in different areas. But this is the data that the engineers are working with. So it is just data that's spitting out, this sensor went on, this sensor went off. There's no, um, when, when we move this into people's homes, there's no video. We're not using any video to, um, to, to decide what people are doing. It's all based on what the sensor data is telling us and the algorithms that the computer sciences, scientists are developing. Now, in the smart home, because we are telling them what to do, we know exactly what they're doing when they're doing it. When we move this into people's homes, we have um, coders that code about a month of data based on what a person usually does, and they say, we think the person is grooming now or eating now, and that's how we, we train the algorithms, and then we can have um, data that actually says, this is what we think the person is doing at this moment in time. Um, this is our smart home in a box. We've been doing experiments where we've actually been handing the box with an active with a brochure to older adults and asking them to install their own smart homes. And then we've been trying to understand where the difficulties are coming up, like how we can make this better, we can make it a more easier process um, for individuals. Um, in terms of uh, some of the first things that we had to do were activity recognition. So we needed to know, could we actually use the sensor data to distinguish between different activities that people were doing? So the very first study that we did, we brought people into our smart home, and we had them first make a phone call, and it told them about a recipe that they wrote down. Then they had to go and wash their hands, and then they had to cook the oatmeal, and then they ate it, and then they cleaned up. And we looked at the sensor data, and we wanted to see, could we use algorithms to pull apart these different activities? And we found with a pretty high degree of accuracy that we could distinguish these five different activities. So we were pretty excited, but if you're thinking about everyday life, you might be thinking, do we usually just do one activity at a time? And so the next thing we had to look at is, what about if you're multitasking, doing multiple activities? Or what about if there's more than one person in the environment? Can we detect that? And people were saying, but yeah, you can do it in the smart home, but what about when you take it out into the real world and you've got pets and other people in the environment? And definitely, these have um, made things a little bit more challenging. And in fact, in our work, we do try to avoid having pets in the house, especially cats because cats can teleport from, they really can, from one end of the house to the other, because they don't trip any of the sensors, so you don't know what happened to them. Uh, so, so we've been trying to work with single um, homes uh, in, in most of our research. And working in the homes, the algorithms have gotten uh, more complex, and we can take into account more things like time of day and a person's pattern, um, how they usually do um, activities. But even doing that, even if we were able to track all the activities of daily living that we you know, look at in our questionnaires, we're still left with this big other category because we do a lot of individual things. And so we've also looked at can we discover activities that people are doing. And this particular one here is my favorite because we had no idea what was going on. These were students who were living in our smart home and we said, what, what is this? Can you tell us? And she said, oh my gosh, I um, sit down on the couch to eat, or, or, or to watch TV, I get up and get something from the refrigerator to eat, and I go back and sit back down. And so we were able to detect, I mean, it was happening so often that we were able to detect. Um, <laughs> Hopefully she was studying too. So um, one of the things that we're doing right now is trying to validate our activity recognition algorithm. So, you know, I always tell the, the computer scientists, just because you think this is what is happening doesn't mean it's really what's happening. So, um, our participants have tablets, and four times a day, um, at different times, when it detects that they're doing an activity, it will ask them to come to the tablet and it will say, are you cooking now? That thinks that that's what they're doing. And then they can tell us whether or not they're cooking. And if they're not cooking, then they can tell us what they're doing. So we're able to get some um, information about how accurate our algorithms are. Now, activity recognition is really um, at the, 
underneath these other things that we want to do. So we want to be able to tell something about a person's functional health, such as they're keeping their plants watered, right? Um, so the way that we've done this in our smart home test bed is bring people in, healthy older adults, people with mild cognitive impairment and dementia, had them do different tasks, and coded how well they were doing the task as they were doing them. Then we looked at how well that correlated with our sensor data. So sensor data, we looked at things like which sensors were going off, how long they were going off, where, what area they were in. And we found that um, across the groups from healthy to dementia, we got a correlation between our observations and the sensor data of about 0.62. So we were pretty excited that maybe we actually could use these sensor data to tell us something about how people were functioning. In longitudinal studies in people's homes, we actually get to use the person's data as their own baseline. And so we thought that that would help things um, tremendously. So we've looked at different ways of trying to predict um, any sort of changes that are occurring over long lines of time, but also trying to get acute healthcare events too. So we've had some people who have been living in smart homes for as many as four years now. And we've been testing them every six months clinically and trying to see if we could predict changes in their clinical scores. And we've also tried to look at modeling their daily behavior. So this is an example of our activity curves, which are really abstractions of an individual's normal routine. This is a person over the two years, and this is looking at um, data month by month, this um, person here on the right, um, who basically is showing no change in their routine. This is an individual who actually transitioned um, through myocognitive impairment towards dementia, and you can see that there were some significant changes in their routine over the course of, of this time. So for example, in the month of March, if they were going to sleep at 10, getting up at 6, eating breakfast at 7, eating lunch at 2, going out for a walk at 4, and dining at 8, and that was pretty regular, and now all of a sudden they're sleeping at 8, waking up frequently during the night, getting up at 10, they're not eating breakfast, they eat lunch at 11, they're not going out for a walk, and they're dining at 7, we can see that there's some significant change that has occurred in their routine. We've also been going back through our data to identify significant healthcare events and see if on a smaller level we can actually detect changes when those healthcare events occur. And so this was an example of an individual who started radiation treatment and this is done in weeks rather than months and we were able to pick up a big change mostly related to her sleeping and to the activity of people going in and out of the house um, that were associated with, with this change. Um, in her overall routine. Um, one of the things that we're working on now is including a clinician in the loop. So we are doing much um, deeper analysis of our data by having a clinician do telehealth uh, with the individuals in, smart home, in the smart homes every two weeks so that we can really track what's happening for them um, week to week. And we're hoping that this is um, going to be helpful. But in terms of translating this into something that's really clinically useful, we do have to demonstrate that our algorithms that we think are measuring health-related things like poor sleep or um, uh, good um, overall activity are reliable and valid. And even if they're reliable and valid, our next step is really to demonstrate that they're going to be useful to clinicians. So um, it's going to change my view of what I think is happening for that individual. And I think that there's a real possibility for this because as a clinician, um, if someone comes in and I test them like year one and they're functioning here, and then they come in and let's say this is kind of a bad day, I see them a year later and they're still functioning here, but what's happened is over time, there's been this downward trajectory. I just happened to get them on a good day. I might say there's been no change, but if I had all this data, I might make a different decision. Okay, so the third thing then is can we automate intervention? So can we actually assist people? Can we use this knowledge that we've learned to assist people? And I was saying earlier that one thing that's really exciting about intelligent technology is if you need to have a reminder about medication. You don't need to set that reminder to be 8 o'clock every day. If you typically take your medication with breakfast and you decide to sleep in 30 extra minutes one day, it will know that 
you take your medication with your breakfast, you've got up, you've eaten breakfast, you haven't taken your medication, it can prompt you then to take your medication. Um, so it only has to prompt you if you don't engage in the activity. And if you are prompted and then you don't engage in the activity, it will know that and can reissue um, a prompt. So some of the questions that we've been interested in here is what sort of prompts are really going to help people with mild cognitive impairment and dementia? And are they going to respond to these prompts in the environment? And so we've looked at um, varying cue types, the way that caregivers do, starting with kind of an indirect cue that um, gets the person to, to think about the activity, such as the oatmeal will burn if the stove is left on, but doesn't really tell them what to do. And then we go to a more direct prompt, turn the stove off now. And then if that doesn't work, we have a multimodal prompt that tells the person to go to a tablet. I don't know how we're doing long time. Oh. Um, uh, it tells the person to go to the tablet and then actually show someone turning the stove off and tells them to turn the stove off now. Um, so what we found uh, in our research, and these are individuals, healthy older adults, as, those, as well as those with single domain mild cognitive impairment. So these are people who have difficulties in one area of cognitive functioning. Could be memory, could be uh, speed and processing, um, versus people who have difficulties in more than one domain. We found that those um, people that had difficulties in more than one domain needed more prompts. But what was really exciting is that indirect prompt was just as good at getting them back on task and having them finish the task. And anecdotally, from social psychology, we know that people don't always like to be told exactly what to do, so we thought that this was probably a good way to do things. But in our next study, we actually had people make an error for one of three activities, which we counterbalanced, and we then gave them an indirect, a direct, or a multimodal cue. And for both people who reported fewer cognitive complaints and more cognitive complaints, the indirect cue was actually the least liked of the cue. Um, our cognitive complainers uh, really like the more support, the multimodal cues, and the few cognitive complaints um, like the direct cues. And people who were having more difficulty with their memory tended to pr um, prefer the uh, multimodal cue. So again, uh, you know, this suggests that when we're thinking about these different technologies, we may have to think about differences um, as people, well, we do need to think, as, as people have changes in cognition and different preferences. Um, this is actually the work that's funded by the Department of Defense. So um, this is our digital memory notebook. And we are working uh, very hard doing iterative design with individuals with mild cognitive impairment to develop this notebook in a way that it's going to be very simple for people to use. Now, one of the things that's really exciting about this work is that we are going to be partnering it with our smart environment so that our smart home can actually feed things into the memory notebook, like you took your medication or um, you've eaten today, so that they don't and their caregivers don't have to track all of that information. Um, they can use it then to have uh, a running from what they put in it of things that they've done in the past as well as plan prospectively for appointments and things they need to do in the future. Um, the other thing is that the smart home can learn to prompt people to use the memory notebook at opportune times. So we're looking at prompting during transition periods where we're not going to interrupt them um, in, in other activities, but also when something unusual happens. Like let's say they've had visitors over and it might be a good idea to record that information so they have that. So we're starting to, to partner these um, uh, practices that we know are helpful in rehabilitation with the technology. So some of the challenges we have are making the, the technologies acceptable to the end users. So we do a lot of work with the end users because they're really important in developing the technology. Um, if we want to do activity-aware interventions, we have to be able to detect that everyday situation that we're going to intervene on. And so that is one of the challenges. And we have to do it in such a way that we're not going to have tons of false positives, right? That, that's a problem with a lot of our, our falls prevention technology. Um, we want to design technologies that don't require a lot of new learning on the user because we're trying to work with people with mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And we also um, don't want them to have to do things out of the ordinary, like put on some sort of wearable technology every day. 
Um, we want to design it in a way that it's going to be low in cost and protect their privacy. And also, um, you know, there's questions about how you're going to keep people um, motivated and interested, right? After a while, you might just say, I don't want to listen to that prompt anymore, right? So how, how are, are we going to um, make that something possible? Um, so I thought I would end with a vignette. Um, that kind of ties uh, a lot of this information together. So let's say you have a 72-year-old grandmother and she's experiencing memory difficulties. She's recently had a minor fall in the bedroom at night. She's experiencing some daily living difficulties. So medication management, she's forgetting to take her medications when she goes out, even though she always brings her pillbox with her. Um, cooking and cleaning, there's been a few incidences where she's forgot to turn off her appliances. Uh, her hearing is generally okay, but she has difficulty with those high frequency sounds and she has moderate to severe arthritis. So, you know, the first thing that I would say that's important for everyone is protect that brain health, right? So, cognitive engagement, engage in new learning. And some of the things that people are saying um, as guidelines, think about new learning as things that are active and effortful that you want to do at least three times a day for 20 minutes. Um, and these need to be things that are going to, they're not automatic, they're going to really encourage you um, to be thinking and to be doing new learning. Uh, nutrition, drink six glasses of water each day, eat those low fat and low sodium foods, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, especially those that are high in antioxidants. Avoid fried fruits, avoid tobacco and excessive alcohol use. Exercise, I mentioned that before, that's probably the, one of the biggest things I would encourage people to do. Engage in regular and varied exercise. Stress reduction, um, you know, that may be hard for some of us, but it's one of those things that, that is really important um, in terms of protecting brain health. Sleep, be sure to get plenty of sleep, incorporate sleep hygiene. Social engagement, I, I talked about that as being one that a lot of people don't think about, but how important that really is to good brain health. And then these compensatory strategies that can help um, be very preventative, can help reduce stress, and it can help people maintain their independence. So just some examples for um, this grandmother, uh, you know, something that she can put in her, in her pocket that would vibrate or have some sort of alarm on it uh, to help her remember when she's out or some sort of app for her phone. Household appliances, there's automatic stove and automatic outlet shutoff um, that can be used. For hearing, um, if she's having uh, difficulty hearing, there can be things for the fire alarms to signal things like a doorbell, um, Fall prevention, there's a number of different mechanisms for that. And then if we get to the point where we can integrate it all together, maybe one day we'll really have a digital memory notebook hooked with a smart home that can do real-time intervention uh, for individuals. Uh, here's just some information about aging service technology resources. And then I want to recognize all my contributors, especially my colleagues in computer science and engineering, um, medicine, uh, psychology and nursing, all the students that have been involved in these projects, and then all my funding sources. Can you put back the slide with the links? So oh, yeah.